Our scriptures today is probably the major turning point in the book of Matthew. There was this growing opposition against Jesus by the king and the Israelite leaders as they tried to secure power over this new up-and-coming movement around this Jesus from Nazareth. And it all climaxed when these Israelite leaders concluded and told everyone around that Jesus' power and authority didn't come from divine heaven. It came from the devil. The devil made him do it, right? The devil is filling Jesus up. Now, while their full rejection of Jesus did not occur till later, boy, those leaders cast the dice. And at this point is where in Matthew, Jesus turns the table and starts teaching about the true kingdom of God, about what the kingdom truly is, where the divine power really comes from. And so in today's text, as I studied it this week, I didn't know what to do. Let's be honest. It's straightforward, isn't it? And one of the pieces that I truly believe in and was taught and follow through on is to try and avoid something pastors can get themselves into. Most preachers today will come up with some secret meaning in the text that is really not conveyed in it at all. They try and analogize it to the point where it kind of loses its original meaning. They do this in an attempt to make the text relevant to you. Hmm? Instead of letting the text, when you read Scripture, come to you to read it and reflect on it and have the text change you, interpret you, we oftentimes, when we have a point we want to make or have an idea of what we want to do, we force it to fit our story. We force it to fit our narrative, our life, our world context, instead of just saying what it says. And that's when I'm always reminded the task of the preacher is not to make the text relevant, right? It already is. You're sitting here listening to me. It already is relevant. You're in the room with me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here preaching it in the first place. Rather, the, tax, uh, the task of a good preacher is to proclaim God's story so that it changes ours. Basically, the do the text to the hearer. My job is just to read the text and get out of its way. That's the true heart of a preacher. Just preach it. In today's text, more than many, Jesus is speaking clearly and is blatantly doing all the work, doing all the work for us. And so today for a change, I'm just going to proclaim the text. And what I did on the back of the bulletins, if you did take one, is I created and I just kind of threw out there some of the basic elements of story, character, plot, conflict, resolution. And as you hear the story again, just think of all these pieces in the story, what Jesus is doing, uh, what He's doing with it, because all the elements are very simple, but it has a very powerful ending. And so I say all of this, those who have ears, let them hear. And so let the Holy Spirit move us to change our story. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed seed. I went to go buy wheat, but it was hard to find, and so grass will have to do. And then when I opened it up, I found it was coated in green stuff. So anyway, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed into his field. I'm creative, not clean up, so that doesn't bother me. <laughs> but while everyone was sleeping, you have no idea how hard this was to get this morning. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. I got a backup. Ooh, that's good. And then he went away. I think we all can get that illustration, can't we? I fight those weeds 
every day. Now, when the weed sprouted and formed heads, when the grass grew, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Well, we even know today it just it is the good and the bad are all next to each other. An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Have you seen the tool that takes dandelions out of ground? I should have brought it, that big bifurcated thing that rips up everything around it. No, 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 he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. You may pull up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The text. And, and if that wasn't straightforward enough, I think we all know it's seed and weed and good and bad. And They asked him later because the ending was so disturbing to the disciples, they actually asked Again, could you explain that for us? So not only does he give us a wonderful story, he explained it. So what am I going to do? Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seeds is the son of man. The good field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who throws them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Now, don't miss this language. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out His kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. Now there's this beautiful story. And if you ask me, I love God creator. I think God is at his best when he's creating. Okay? And in this sense, he created this incredible story for everyone to listen to. It's simple. It's straightforward. And as I mauled it back and forth this week going, what am I going to do to it? And I don't have to explain what a denarii is or what donkeys were used for. I don't do any of that. There it is. Jesus is proclaiming this unabashedly, unapologetically. He's giving them a very simple story with a very powerful ending. And if you're keeping track of the characters, there are so many in here, the farmer, or the son of man, the field, the good seed, the weeds, the enemy, the devil, this, this harvest, the harvesters, the angels. If you were thinking about the plot, oh my gosh, what a, what a, what a simple but, but really neat plot. This man sows good seed, and then of course the, the, the weeds come, and, and both are allowed to grow together. Both the good and the bad were allowed to grow where, where God would water Bring, bring food and water to the righteous and unrighteous in this world as they grow up next to each other. And, and just as a question, which one did you think you were, by the way? Are we kind of both sometimes? And so are you happy he doesn't rip you out of the ground too early? Uh, it, it's very interesting watching all of this happening. And so um, he says, no, leave him in there. And then he gets into it. First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So you have this incredible deal. Conflict. There's always good conflict in good stories. And you see the conflict going on in here. The good farmer versus his enemy. The son of God versus the evil one. The good and the evil. The wheat growing, living among the weeds. The people of the kingdom versus the people of the evil one. Destruction versus existence. Life versus death. Which got me to the point where I did want to say something about this incredible story of Jesus. Life versus death. 
It's the resolution of the story. It really caught my attention. See, at this time, the disciples didn't know that he would have to die, right, to fulfill this kingdom. And so they were confused, and that's why they asked, tell us more about the end. You know, what does that mean? Because there is no, well, escaping it. It's kind of crazy. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the disciples looking at each other are going, um, we're evil. We cause sin. We're broken. So if that's the case, then what's going to happen to us again? Burned into the fire, gnashing and wailing at the end when we are judged? There is no gray area here in Jesus' story. There is no 51% good or 99% good is good enough. We are judged good or evil in the end. You are either people of the kingdom or you are people of the evil one, and you will be judged. And folks, we are all up against the wall here. We don't often preach this as a church, but Jesus is preaching it for me in this text unapologetically. The time is coming, declares the Lord. Hmm? Where are you? Where are you right now? And there's no escaping the text. You know, we're in it. And, and, and there's so many acronyms going out there, I decided to do my own. W-D-Y-W-F-M-N. And I shouldn't have put it in. I, I, I should have just let them struggle. Anyway, what do you want from me now? Okay? So as, as you hear this story, and it really started to sink in this ending, like he, the, the one piece he didn't elaborate on is, how do I get on the right side of that story? How do I get on that right side? Because I'm never going to be 100% good. I'm, I probably will never make 51% good. How do I pull this off? How do I become sons and daughters of the kingdom? What do you want from me now? That's the beauty of it. Jesus Christ, in the midst of telling this, has a surety about him. He has an answer with him. He is the answer. Thanks be to God that Christ Jesus is our answer. He has the, paid the price for our sin and evil, and so he is judged for us. When we go before the throne someday, when we are going to be judged, and everyone in this room will be judged around the world, are you good or are you evil? Are you of the evil one? Do you cause sin? Do you bring evil into the world? You will be judged, period. Jesus says so. When you stand before the judge someday, this is what Jesus promised. I will stand in front of you, and he will judge me instead. So as I am before the throne, this righteousness that Jesus attained for me on the cross, that's what will be judged. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in it together. We're up against the wall, and it is coming sooner or later. But this is the beauty of it. But we are justified freely, which means you didn't earn it. There's nothing for you to attain it. There's nothing for you to keep it. You are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so the narrator of the story, the creator of the story, the teller of the story is sitting there with the answer. <laughs> it's Him. And the hearers at the time didn't understand, but I proclaim it to you today. It is Jesus Christ. We are now sons and daughters of the kingdom of God because of Jesus. So how does this play out. <laughs> what do you want from me now? I should expand that. What do you want from me now? Christ Jesus. Put a C and a G in there, or J in there. See how long I can get it. What do you want from me now? This is the first. We repent. We go before the Lord and say, forgive me. Forgive me for my actions, my deeds, and the things I didn't do. We do that in church, don't we? That's the rhythm of faith. We come out with the confession, the Ten Commandments. Then we declare the Apostles' Creed, what He's done for us, and then we preach His Word, and then at the end we pray to Him, now strengthen me and help me live my life. It is the rhythm of faith because we succeed, we feel great, then we fail. 
Then we succeed. We feel it's, it's just rhythm, right? It's just constant repentance and filling. And so repent before God. Ask for forgiveness. Ask. He will give it. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Some sooner, some later. Repent. I do it. Christians do it. Repent. Okay? What do you want from me now? Connect. You repent before God. You don't even have to have a relationship with Him at first. Just turn to Jesus and say, I need your help. I can't do it. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Take my life. Help me. And then you get to know Jesus Christ by connecting with our Savior, right? Through prayer, through just talking with Him, through listening and reading His Word, through spending time with other believers who share their foibles. That, did you know you can repent, you can confess to one another and receive forgiveness? This is all about Jesus and belonging and, and having somewhere to be. You connect with Jesus, spend that time with Him, get to know Him better. And as you sink deeper into Christ, the world begins to open up. Life begins to enter into your own where, where you can truly live because life with Jesus begins now and lasts forever. You connect with Him. Love this with Paul. I have been crucified with Christ, and I, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, well, I live by faith in the Son of God now, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so he's got me. Jesus says, I got gotcha. you. I'm not big on icons, and I'm, I'm not much of a crier, but there is an image that always kind of gets me. It's it's one of Jesus standing, and you can only see about to hear, and he has his hand on a child like this. You know, that amazing comfort of knowing he's present and he's got you. I've got you. Through this life and the one to come, I've got you. That we believe in Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to go where he goes. Where Jesus is, I am. He is who we are now. And so we connect with him. One last little bit. What do you want from me now? We repent. We connect through our life with him. And then after he does these amazing things for us, we want to do something. Do you want bananas? Can I leave bananas at the altar? Can I, can I give you a present, Jesus? What can I do for you, Jesus, for everything? And he goes, I don't want your garbage. Turn to one another. Turn to one another and love them. As I have loved you, now go love them. Do things for them in great thanks for what I have done for you. Not out of obligation, but out of sheer joy and thankfulness. He goes, now turn to another. Serve your community. Serve the people around you. Let what God has filled into you bubble over. Increase your neighbor's store of it. Just give it away. Give away everything I've given to you. Give it away. I don't need anything back. You, my brothers and sisters, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law is summed up right here. Love the Lord. Seek repentance. Know him. Develop a relationship with him over the years. And then turn around and just give away what he's given to you. This is our Lord. So remember, Jesus is for you, not against you. It's not that there is only one way to eternal life. It's that there is a way, and it's a way where you just have to receive it. You have to earn it. You just have to receive it, accept it. If you haven't done it yet now, this is the time to do it. Turn to him and pray. Repent, turn it over, and he will come into your life. And it will be a great one, I promise, throughout the years. He came here to save. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. What a wonderful way. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus has prepared a place for you. Where are you at right now in your life? And so we repent. We connect 
and serve as we wait for his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I wish someone should make a prayer out of that. Amen.